Welcome to Oracle IDF. My name is Frank Nymphius and I'm from the Oracle JDF and ADF Proc Management Team. In this session I'll talk about programming best practices on the binding layer. Now before we go into the details here we need to be aware of what exactly is the binding layer and how does it look at runtime. Well at design time the binding layer is all about metadata. Every page that you drag and drop components from the data control palette to will be associated with the page definition file. And this page definition file contains metadata objects that represents the component binding for a specific user interface component. On the other side of the binding is a data control. So through the data control we talk to the business service. You can look at the binding layer as the gluing that exists between the user interface component and the business service. At runtime, however, the binding is not metadata. At runtime, it's a Java framework, so we have to use Java objects at runtime. And here, as you can see on the slide, we have two types of objects that we're dealing with. One set starts with JU. Now, JU represents all of the generic public binding classes, whereas faces control bindings are very sophisticated binding classes for the Java server faces framework. So there are two types of bindings. And typically, when you develop applications, you should use the JU binding classes. How do you access the binding layer if you're building your application? There are two choices that you have. One is expression language and the other one is Java. Now, from expression language, if I want to reach out to the binding layer, all I have to do is I have to start building an expression language that references the bindings as the top level object. So hash curly braces bindings will give you an access to the binding container. And then if I want to access, say, a tree binding within this binding container, I will use hash curly braces bindings dot tree binding name. And then, of course, I will have to call sub objects within that, like collection model, if I want to populate a tree with the content of the tree binding. If I want to access, for instance, an attribute, I could use hash bindings dot first name and then whatever property I want to access, typically the value. So hash bindings first name dot input value or dot hints if I want to get access to the tooltips. Everything I can access from expression language in IDF I can also do from Java. And here the top level class to start with is binding context. Now binding context represents the data binding CPX file. Binding context get current get current bindings entry will give me a reference to the binding container of the current active binding container. Now that could be the binding container that belongs to a page or to a fragment that executes within the context of a region. So these are my two options. If on the binding container I call get and the name of an attribute binding or a name of a tree binding, I get an object back which I will have to cast to either attribute binding or if it's a tree binding to JU control hierarchical binding. So actually we have to know what are the objects to cast that back in. Now one way around this and maybe easier to use for beginners would be to cast the binding reference to DC binding container which will give you typed interfaces. One method would be find iterator that returns a find iterator object which is of type DC iterator binding. So it casts this already for you and therefore it's easier to use. Now, as you can imagine, there are public classes and internal classes within the framework as typically every framework tries to obstruct and prevent direct access to implementation details that might be subject of change throughout the life cycle of a product. Same for Oracle IDF. So there are internal packaged classes that you shouldn't use. For example, all of the faces control bindings are all part of these internal classes and you shouldn't use this for that reason. Now the JO control bindings are in a public API package and for that reason can be used. Now look out for the packaging structure of the class that you import. If it has the name internal in it then don't use it. The reason why we cannot hide those classes from you is because the framework has to deal with Java objects and Java methods and all that Java gives us is a method to be specified as public, protected or private. Unfortunately, the framework also needs to use classes that are public. Now, to flag this to you that you shouldn't use specific classes, we put them into a package called internal. And in addition, we create an audit rule in Oracle JDeveloper that flags this in the IDE as red, 
just in case that you're trying to access this and if you do then actually you know that this is something you need to change. So what do you want to do if you access a class that either you're not sure if that is internal or public or that you definitely know that you need but you don't know how to work around this. Now here probably the best suggestion to give is to use expression language. Example, on the table we have a selection listener that ends with make current to set the current record in synchronization with the selection in the table. Now what you can do is you can write a custom selection listener and create a method expression that calls out to this expression language string that you copy and paste out of the default selection listener. So this way you preserve the default framework behavior and then can start customizing it. Now if you want to code your business logic into your application, so you want to access business logic from your client, then there's a little trick to share here. And the trick, which also makes best uh, practice recommendation, is that you should not put any business service related code into the uh, managed bin. Instead, what you should do is you should put this code into the business service and expose it on a client interface if you're working with ADF business components. That could be an impl class that you created on the view object or on the application module. And then you go into the Java section for this object and expose it on the client interface so that it shows on the data control palette. But even then, if it shows there, you're not directly accessing it you always create a binding. So you always work through the binding layer. That's very important when you develop applications with ADF. Always work through the binding layer. And there are many ways to work around the binding layer. For instance, if I know that there is a method exposed on the application module, what I could do is I could go and call binding context, find data control, get application module, and then cast this to my application module. The difference here is that most likely the framework will be smart enough to detect changes on the business side and refresh the user interface. However, chances are that that will fail, in which case you will have a missynchronization between what happens on the business service or on the binding layer. In addition, all of the error handling, which I will talk later about, will not go through the binding layer, but it will go straight to your managed bean, for example. So you will have to make sure to enforce consistent error handling that you have a good memory and that your team has a very good development guide. You can see the working around the binding layer and the working through the binding layer as an example I recently gave during a training. Now if you're in New York and you don't want to know how to get to Fifth Avenue, one way to get there would be to ask a taxi driver for the direction. Now probably their kind so they will point you to how to get to Fifth Avenue. The problem now is that the taxi driver would not take responsibility to get you there. So that is pointing the direction and you're on your own. If something happens along the way, you're still on your own. However, if you join the ride with the taxi driver, which is equivalent to working through the binding layer, then the taxi driver will make sure you get to Fifth Avenue and if there's something on the way that happens, you still have help in the form of the taxi driver. So this is what the binding layer would provide. So if you access business services through the binding layer. So that includes that you create a binding, like a method binding, if you want to invoke a method on the business service. So say you expose some computation. How do you create that? So how do you kind of set it all up? And there again are two different options. And this graphic here shows you the two options. First of all, I do have access through a button and I have access through an input text field. And both work with different bindings on the binding layer and both access something on the business service. Now what I can do is I can access information from a managed bean or straight using a special language. As I mentioned you can use both ways. If I drag and drop a method activity or method from the data control palette onto my page or on a method activity in the controller then actually it will create a page definition file with the action binding in it. If I drag and drop a property from my um, business service file, then it will create an attribute binding. So I could create all of what's required, the managed bean and the expression language um, files, either by drag and drop, or I can manually create this by going to the page definition file, which I access on the visual editor, 
clicking on the bindings tab and then using the green plus icon on the binding section to create an attribute binding or a method binding and then use that from Java code. The Java code to access the binding are just three to four lines of code. Not very difficult. However, you could even have Oracle JDeveloper generating that for you. For instance, if you double click on a button which previously was created by dragging a method from the data control palette and then in the dialog specify create new managed bean or use existing managed bean, create a method in there and there's a little checkbox. If you select this checkbox, it will generate the four lines of code so that you have the code. You can later on even remove the button, but however, if you remove the button, make sure you remove it from the source uh, palette or from the source editor and not from the visual editor and not from the structure window because otherwise the binding will be cleaned up as well. And as this picture shows, you then work from the user interface component, be it a text field or be it a button or even from a managed bean, always through the page definition file to the business service. This ensures that you have a very consistent way of programming. All that you need to learn about is the API that Oracle IDF works with. And then whoever, if it's a different developer or a different page or even different application, accesses this business logic, they always execute the same logic so you don't have to worry about differences. So the last topic to cover is error handling. And there is a separate recording about error handling. You want to, you want to go to that. So if this recording here is the first one that you started watching ADF TV, just go back to error handling for the full story. However, on the binding layer, you can specify error handling and the binding actually is responsible for catching all of the errors that are raised on the business service while accessed through the binding layer. And there are several uh, times when the binding layer accesses the business service throughout the uh, lifecycle of a request. That is just for validation, this is for update model or for invoke application or for uh, render response. So four times where potentially your code will access the binding layer and then the business service might throw an exception or not. If it throws an exception, you want to make sure the binding layer catches this. And then you have the choice that you could format the message, even um, skip specific exceptions or suppress exceptions. As here on this slide, all of the exceptions that are raised within ADF business components or the ADF binding layer itself are of type JVO exception. And the recommendation is that if you need to throw exceptions yourself, which typically you want to do as application exceptions, like validation errors or business logic errors, there is no other way in Java to raise those exceptions to the view other than throwing an exception. So what you want to do is you want to create your own application exceptions that extend JVO exception. One of the benefits of JVO exceptions is that they extend runtime exceptions. So you don't have to declare the methods to throw an exception. Does it make sense? I hope so. So always use JBO exceptions when you throw it because that also will bundle exceptions for you. That means that if you have 100 validation errors, it doesn't ask you to click 100 times OK just to get over it. It will just give you all of the 100 exceptions in one bundle and then the exception handler will be able to pause it, look into it and just show the one that the user might be interested in. To create your own exception handler, you would override the Oracle default class that an ADF would provide. And that is the DC error handler impl file. So that's the default file that we have and that the framework behavior is determined by. Now, if you create your custom version and you extend our impl file here, then you have several methods that you can override. You can change the report exception method to suppress an error or just, you know, handle it differently or maybe lock an error or uh, have incident reports and if you want to learn about incident reporting just go to the session on error handler that gives you a little bit more on this one. You can change the display message, you can format the message by putting HTML formatting tags in it. You can also skip specific exceptions. Just to give an example, if there is an exception that is coming from the database like a uh, unique key violation, typically you want to put this so that the user knows that, for instance, the email address that the user provides is already taken by somebody else, instead of just showing the database exception message. So you want to change for the type of mess message. And if it's kind of a constraint exception, you will just skip that exception. So it will be not broadcasted to the user. To configure your custom class, you go 
to the data binding CPX file, which is part of the view controller project. And you do this on the assembling project because you can only have one error handler set for an application. So it doesn't help if you put a different error handler in different bounded task flows uh, that you deploy as ADF libraries because only one can be used as runtime. So there are two strategies here. Either the top level application is the only uh, kind of project that has a custom error handler or you put the same error handler into all of the deployed artifacts in all bounded task flows and in the uh, assembling application so you make sure that whatever error handler is chosen it will be the same routine that you follow here. So if you want to configure that then you select the data binding CPX file as shown here on the screenshot. You go to the structure window, select the top level node, open the property inspector and there's an error handler property where you just specify the package name and the complete class name that represents your error handler. And you can see some sample source on the slide as well if you look in the middle of the IDE. And again, if you're more interested to learn about the overall options that you have for error handling in Oracle ADF, I recommend going back a few sessions where I talk about error handling in detail. So this concludes the third recording on programming best practices. The takeaway is always work through the binding layer, never work around and you're on the safe side. And the last recording on this programming best practices is about ADF phases and JavaScript and that's part four.